And therefore the pact that the Chinese Communist Party has with its people, that is keep quiet, obey us, and then your standards of living will rise and you'll get most of the freedoms that anybody else has got, but you won't be able to talk about politics and democracy. That pact <clears throat> is fraying. It's a massive warning shot across the Chinese Communist Party's bows, uh, bows because um, this, this sort of uh, nationwide unrest, that protests, uh, taking on the police, uh, calling for the resignation and stepping down as Xi Jinping, calling for freedom and democracy hasn't happened since the 1989 uh, protests, which were violently put down uh, then. Uh, I think that what will happen now is that they will, so there will be the, the, the ringleaders or, or the people that led those protests are in for a very uncomfortable few years. Um, we don't quite know what's going to happen to them. Of course, with the technology that China has and is leading the world on, the surveillance technology, their identities are known immediately. The facial recognition, the surveillance that's around, uh, the, the, those sort of elements, their phones and all that, they, these people can be traced and already their families are being called, they're being called and being told to step back and go inside. Uh, but I think what has happened here, Carol, is, is that the the people that have come out on the streets, and it's a general sentiment, I've been getting emails and talking to people in China, it's general sentiment throughout, is that the COVID policy hasn't worked. And therefore the pact that the Chinese Communist Party has with its people, that is keep quiet, obey us, and then your standards of living will rise and you'll get most of the freedoms that anybody else has got, but you won't be able to talk about politics and democracy. That pact <clears throat> is fraying there are strains on it and they've got to act very quickly and very fast to say okay we're going to crack down on the people that led these protests or are leading these protests and they have to give something in return and there is very little sign uh, that the chinese authorities are prepared to abandon this zero covid policy and clearly their population is now aware that they are one of the few countries that are still suffering these lockdowns. Uh, the Chinese authorities have even apparently tried to edit the footage coming in of the World Cup where they can see people happily milling around together in the stands. Yes, I mean, they've dug themselves into a, a bit of a hole on this. A lot of it's to do with a, a, the Chinese culture thing of face and pride and, and, and that sort of thing. Their vaccine is not well standard. Uh, they haven't managed to uh, produce their own vaccine that is as good as the vaccines and the rest, and they're not importing it in enough numbers, at least, to, to do it. Also, if they had the sort of high levels of infections that we had here in the West, the health service couldn't handle it, and that would be exposed. So they're being exposed on two sides now, and they've got to navigate a very careful course so that they're not going to be shown that, OK, the Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party has been in power for all these decades and we still don't have a health service. Oh, OK, we claim to be uh, brilliant and ahead at technology and science, but we can't produce a vaccine like the West produced. So there's no point in them stepping up the vaccination programme as they're saying that they're going to, given that the vaccine doesn't seem to be working very well. I mean, I mean that is a you know that is the million dollar question. I mean, they have to step it up. They haven't got the sort of um, uh, figures of vaccination that, that we've got over here. But I think that the other element here is that because of this lockdown policy, and also because of the way China has been pushing out against the West over the past decade, while Xi Jinping has been in power. Um, <clears throat> this is actually producing businesses are moving out. I mean, would you go and set up a factory in China now knowing that your staff could be locked down at a moment's notice, knowing that you could be at odds with Western governments, with who you get most of your business and who you sell most of your products to? China is digging itself into this very difficult position. And we've seen the Chinese ambassador in the UK summoned into the foreign office uh, to face uh, protests over the treatment of a BBC journalist who was treated pretty roughly while trying to cover those demonstrations out in China. I mean, that's a diplomatic wrap over the knuckles. Do you think China cares about things like that? Well, it's beginning to care and has to begin to care, but actually... You know, it does and it doesn't. I mean, what's happened over the past, say, 20 years is that China has been looking 
at us in the West, and it's seen the financial collapse of 15 or so years ago. It's seen the mess that the West got into over its democracy in Iraq. And it's actually got a lot of confidence saying that our system is a superior system. Um, and now something like this comes along and, it, and, it, and it's showing that their system might not be a superior system. So there's a lot of thinking and debate that would be going on. And when I say debate, there are there is debate in China uh, as, to, as to what direction to go from here. But the, the other issue that we've had, Carol, is that Xi Jinping, who's been in power for 10 years, has just given himself, or the Chinese Communist Party has given himself a, a light, another term, possibly lifelong leadership. So you have got a leader that has cracked down a lot on his opponents, but at the same time might not be listening to outside advice that doesn't agree with his way of thinking. And we all know where that could lead. What about the British attitude to China? We had the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying last night that the golden era of relations between the UK and China was over. I think many people thought that that was over several years ago. But he's under quite a bit of pressure from Conservative MPs who think that actually overall his tone has softened. He's talking about China posing a systemic challenge rather than a systemic threat to our security. Yes, and I think that the EU calls, us, uh, calls it a systemic rival. Uh, th these are all, this is all semantics for the politics of the day. And I think what, and he mentioned, it, Rishi Sunak mentioned this in, the, in, in, his, in his speech, is that, is that the British government has to look very long term, not to the next prime minister's questions, not to the next election, but very long term indeed. And in that respect, we have to put together some sort of, I don't know, legislation about who invests in our critical infrastructure. What do you do with a diplomat who drags somebody off the streets and beats them up in their diplomatically protected territory? How do we deal with China? And when you look, when I talk to the Chinese people that the, the, the sort of in, in, in positions of, of influence in Beijing, it's like men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Uh, because these, you have these two sort of Western democracies and authoritarian states that there's no meeting of minds on how we operate. And, uh, and, and China, instead of trying to sort of think about it, say 10 years ago when this golden era came in and, and David Cameron's administration was being told by the intelligence agencies, look, this isn't a democracy. We can't have them building our power stations and our high speed railways because this is the structure of the government there. Them ignoring it because they needed the money and hailing this new golden era with an authoritarian state. We've now seen the government buying out China's stake in the new Sizewell C nuclear project in Suffolk. Do you think that that does indicate a new tougher line when it comes to dealing with China? Or is it simply a, a small measure to try and appease a few uh, conservative backbenchers who do want a much, much more robust approach to our dealings with China? I think it's a, it's a very mature line. They should never have been invited to invest in a nuclear power station, which is in essence part of our critical infrastructure. It's the same argument that came on the, the Huawei debate of a couple of years ago as to who should build our 5G networks. And yes, it might be more expensive and it might take longer to have a Western democratic technology going into that. But you don't want to have in there an authoritarian state who in the past, two, three, four years, is now becoming seen as a potential hostile power. And there's more talk of war, there's this systemic rivalry or some systemic threats, all these phrases being, be, be, being tossed around. Uh, so I think we have to row back from that. And, and I think more than that, Carol, is that, is that as a government looking forward 20 years, 30 years or something, we need to have some form of legislation of who does and who does not invest in our critical infrastructure. Who should own our airports, our ports and our power stations? Should it be any authoritarian power or should it be people that we have alliances with that share our values?